Hi everyone, uh, today we're going to be talking about monarch conservation. Uh, my name is Emma Pelton and I'm a conservation biologist in the Endangered Species Program of the Xerces Society and most of my work focuses on monarch conservation in the western United States. So we're going to start out talking about getting to know monarchs and milkweed. Uh, monarch butterflies, uh, their species name is Danaeus plexibus, are found all over the world actually due to human introductions. And so you can see in the orange of this map that we have individual years marked of when monarchs were first introduced or reported. Um, but where monarchs are native to is really limited to the central part of the Americas. So North America is home to the migratory monarch butterfly that we'll be talking about today, but there are also non-migratory um, groups of monarchs that are found even into South America and the islands in between. So as we zero in on these migratory monarchs, which is the subspecies Danaeus plexippus plexippus, it's found uh, throughout the spring and summer in its breeding range, which goes all the way from probably northern Mexico up into southern Canada, wherever milkweed grows. And really that's pretty much all of the lower 48 states. A little bit of an exception up in the Pacific Northwest, once you get um, north of Portland and into Olympia and Seattle, uh, where milkweed typically doesn't grow. So every year, monarchs leave their overwintering sites, which include both high elevation forests in central Mexico and along the California coast and into northern Baja, Mexico. They spread out. They have multiple generations over the spring and summer. Uh, we estimate four to five generations. And then every fall, they return to those overwintering grounds. So no butterfly that was at the overwintering grounds makes it back the next year. They've died off and their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren have continued the journey. And we talk about the population in two segments. There's the eastern population, which breeds east of the Rocky Mountains, and the western population, which breeds west of the Rocky Mountains. So they have kind of separate migratory patterns where most of the butterflies in the west go to California, most of the butterflies in the east go to uh, central Mexico. But we know there is some mixing, and they're genetically indistinct. And so while they're while we think about their conservation as highly linked, it's also important to point out that there are some differences that we'll talk about today. So the monarch lifestyle cycle starts as an individual egg. Uh, the female lays an egg, usually on the underside of a milkweed leaf. It's quite small. It's white and kind of conical in color. And a few days later, you see this black head capsule. You can see the caterpillar in between, and that egg is going to hatch and form a very small larva, also known as a caterpillar. And those caterpillars go through five molts, or instars, um, as they get larger, and then they finally will form a chrysalis. And this entire process takes between 10 and 14 days, depending on the weather. During this time as a caterpillar, milkweed is their main food source. Um, there are very few other plants that they can use, and typically those other plants don't allow them to grow all the way to become adults. So milkweed is the obligate host plant of monarch butterflies, and there are compounds in the milkweed called cardenolides that monarchs sequester in their body when they eat the milkweed, and that allows them to become better protected from predators. So once the monarch is in this chrysalis stage, um, which is this green, green color with gold on the trim of the upper side of the chrysalis, this lasts about 10 to 14 days. Again, this varies with the time of year and the weather. So in total, the entire life cycle from egg to adult is about a month. That adult monarch comes out of the chrysalis, pumps its wings, lets them dry, and really quickly is ready to fly, mate, lay eggs, and continue on the journey. Um, while monarchs are really recognizable, there are a few species that they can get mixed up with more easily. And so ones to look alike, to look out for, include the viceroy, which you can see here. It has an extra band on its lower hind wing that is different than the monarch, which lacks that, um, that vein. Swallowtails uh, are a slightly different color and shape of their wing. They're more of a yellow color and they have a, a tail at the bottom of their hind wing. And then in certain areas, queens, especially in the desert southwest, are another look-alike. So telling female and males apart, females on the upper uh, frame of this photo, and you can see 
if you compare it to the male on the bottom, that she has slightly wider wing veins, the black that outlines each of the wing cells. And then the male uh, has these two dots on the bottom of its hind wing. Um, and so those are the most obvious characteristics to tell them apart. There's also differences if you were able to look at the tip of their abdomen. So monarchs overwinter, as I said, in both California and central Mexico. On the left, we have monarchs overwintering in Monterey pine, a native tree in California. And on the right, we have them overwintering in Mexico. These are really high elevation forests of OML fir trees. And you can see the dark areas are some of the massive clusters of butterflies. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about milkweed, which as I said, is the ultimate food source for monarch caterpillars. Uh, milkweeds are part of the genus Asclepius, and there are over 100 species of milkweed found in North America, with a large number of those used by monarchs. And we often think of milkweeds maybe by the ones that we're familiar with, but because it's such a large group, there are actually milkweeds in a wide variety of habitats. Um, here we've got some showy milkweed on the side of the road, but they can also be found in open prairies, deserts, canyons, wetlands, um, a wide variety of habitats. So for example, this was a field site in Nevada. You can see how dry it is. And zoomed in, uh, the plant that our colleague is looking at is pallid milkweed, which is really small. This is the entire plant with just a few leaves and the flower. This is a really small desert milkweed that doesn't grow in large numbers, but we found monarch caterpillars on it. And monarchs aren't the only ones to use milkweed. There's actually an entire specialist um, insect community that can use milkweed, including flies, wasps, other butterflies, even vertebrates like hummingbirds, um, a lot of our bees, including honeybees and our native bees. And then the vegetation and fruit can also be used uh, by seed bugs, longhorn beetles, and then birds can use the floss um, that comes off of the seeds that allows it to float on the wind and disperse. And it's even been used by humans um, in life vests and in, in jackets and things like that. So to better understand the size of the monarch populations, uh, the Xerces Society coordinates a citizen science project called the Western Monarch Thanksgiving Count. And here are a few of the volunteers at Ardenwood Historic Farm um, in the East Bay of San Francisco. We're looking for monarchs and we're gathering data about how many monarchs are there and where they're located. And so this project, we, um, we coordinate over 100 volunteers with the help of a lot of regional coordinators and one of the count's founders, Mia Monroe. There has been coordination of this count since 1997 during the Thanksgiving time period. And just over the last few years, we've added a second count that takes place around New Year's. And besides just counting butterflies, we also assess habitat um, to look for issues and see what the butterflies are using at the site and the health of the trees. So by using the citizen science data, as well as some older data that stretches back to 1980, researchers in Schultz et al. 2017 looked at the population trends over time. So this graph shows um, abundance index of monarchs. And we go from millions of monarchs, conservative estimate of at least four and a half million butterflies were regularly on the California coast in the 1980s, to a crash in the 1990s, a brief rebound in the late 90s, and then the population really crashed and has stayed low through the 2000s. So we've estimated a 97% decline since the 1980s in the population. And using this data set, we can also look at the risk that the population would dip so low to become extinct. And so the researchers concluded that there's a 72% chance that the population will drop below a quasi-extinction threshold which is kind of a fancy way of saying the population will get so small that it can't bounce back. And just in the past year, in 2018, uh, we actually had monarchs drop below that threshold. And so we will now see as we move forward if they're able to bounce back. Um, but right now, in this past winter, we've had less than 30,000 monarchs reported at the California coast. Similarly, in Mexico, uh, monarchs are counted annually. It's done a little bit differently. The volume and just sheer number of butterflies in area to cover is orders of magnitude higher than in the California coast. So they don't typically count individual butterflies. They instead count the hectares of forest occupied by the monarchs. And this effort really began in the mid-90s. 
and you'll see the total forest occupied in hectares on the vertical axis. You'll see that there is a lot of variation. Every year's been different. But somewhere amid, in the early 2010s, the population really crashed and led to a lot of concern about the population's viability into the future. And the last few years have seen slightly better numbers, but overall there's still been a massive decline since the 1990s. Work done by Simmons et al. Um, found an 80% decline. Um, they did their study in these years, so it's still an 80% decline since the mid-90s with a, a more modest but still really substantial risk of quasi-extinction. And currently, as of spring 2019, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is assessing if the monarch butterfly uh, warrants protection under the Federal Endangered Species Act. So why are monarchs declining? Um, like many invertebrate species, there's a lot of interacting factors and it's hard to tease them out from one another. But the major pieces that most researchers agree on is the loss and degradation of both breeding and migratory habitat. That's really the milkweed and the nectarine plants that they rely on. There's also been a loss and degradation of overwintering sites in both Mexico, uh, mostly due to logging, and in California, mostly due to development. Pesticides, like herbicides, have been linked closely to the decline in breeding habitat, and then pesticides, like uh, insecticides, have been linked to both lethal and sublethal effects of monarchs. And all of these stressors are really exacerbated by some effects of climate change, as well as other factors that we know a little less about, like the interaction of disease and parasites and predation, especially above, above normal background rates as we bring in uh, non-native species. So how can we help? Really providing what monarchs need is a key step in helping their recovery. And so monarchs need food and water. They need these milkweed host plants. They need a diversity of flowering plants for nectar. Um, in some cases, they also need fresh wa water or dew. They also need shelter, including roosting sites along their migratory route where they tend to group up as they move back to their overwintering sites. And they need roosting trees at that overwintering habitat. And so that, both of those pieces um, are things that have to kind of happen at a landscape scale and aren't things that necessarily the average homeowner can contribute to, but are important that collectively we work on protecting their overwintering sites. And finally, throughout their range, protecting them from pesticides. So at Xerces, we do a lot of work restoring pollinator habitat onto farms and in our cities and towns and in our backyards, and so thinking about planting plants that are beneficial to monarchs if you're doing a restoration or if you have land that you can um, add plants to like milkweed or flowers. When it comes to planting milkweed, it's really important to plant native milkweed, which has the most benefits both for monarchs and for other insects. Um, so we've got a great project called the Milkweed Seed Finder where nurseries and seed uh, providers can sign up and advertise when they have uh, seeds available for different milkweed species. So you can go on there and find someone growing milkweed local to your area. If you want to know which milkweed to grow, um, for the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper, if you're found in the West, but also even if you're found in the East, we have great species profiles that are interactive and help you identify different milkweed species and understand what habitats they'll grow best in. We don't recommend non-native milkweed. Um, so this is a photo of a non-native milkweed called tropical milkweed, Asclepius carasavica, which is really widely sold in a lot of nurseries. It's quite attractive. Um, gardeners really enjoy it, and monarchs do like it and use it readily. But it has some unattended consequences if it's planted in areas with really mild climate winters. And so because the plant is non-native and it's from a tropical location, it doesn't die back like a lot of our native milkweeds and it stays evergreen. And because it doesn't die back, it can both interrupt migration of the monarchs, which are typically triggered to be overwintering and be migrating and not breed. And so there, that can lead to an interruption of their behavior. And it's been shown to also lead to a buildup of a protozoan parasite OE that can have population level effects because it weakens the monarchs and can even kill them. So for both of these reasons, we really don't recommend planting tropical milkweed in areas where it's going to easily stay green longer than it should. That includes coastal California, especially parts of Southern California where it's become widespread, and the Gulf states like Florida 
in the edges of Texas um, and adjoining states that also have mild winters. So for planting nectar plants, uh, unlike when they're caterpillars, monarchs are actually generalists when it comes to what they'll nectar on. So they'll use a wide range of plants. But if you want to go native, because it has a lot of other benefits to other bees and butterflies, um, thinking about some species that are native to your area and that will provide blooms throughout the season, spring, summer, and fall. And if you're in the coast of California, the winter blooming plants are also really valuable for those overwintering monarchs who just need to be seeking uh, nectar instead of milkweed. Another way you can help is be really thoughtful about your pesticide use and avoid using um, harmful insecticides and asking questions when you buy plants about how they were raised. So avoid spraying insecticides. This includes mosquito sprays. This also includes systemic pesticides like neonicotinoids that are often used on ornamental plants in gardens and are used in our agricultural production in some settings. These can be lethal to monarchs and other pollinators. And sometimes even if they're not lethal, they can cause these sublethal effects, which means that the pesticides negatively impact the ability of those monarchs to live life to their fullest, reproduce, fly well. Um, when you go to buy plants from a nursery, asking that nursery questions about if they treated those plants with insecticides and trying to um, purchase and support nurseries that are raising plants without really harmful pesticides that negatively impact pollinators. And if you're going to restore habitat, thinking about how far away your habitat garden is from an area like agriculture that might be using insecticides. You can also participate in citizen science, like this very excited child. Um, there's a lot of great citizen science projects uh, focused on monarchs. And so to name just one of them that we haven't touched on, that we help coordinate the Xerces Society along with some partners, is the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. We have our web address and essentially this allows people to report observations of monarchs, milkweed, and uh, monarch behavior such as nectaring and what species they're nectaring on anywhere west of the Rocky Mountains. And you can also download and view existing records that other people have contributed. And we have over 50,000 records. And this is being used in real time by researchers to better understand where the ideal places are for habitat restoration of milkweed and monarchs, and also where we need to put out more survey effort. And so besides these, um, other projects we'd really recommend include the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project from the University of Minnesota, Journey North, which is now at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and tagging programs like the one this child was doing uh, that help us better track the migration. And if you have a butterfly in hand, you can test it for the protozoan parasite OE with Project Monarch Health. Another point is that really ways to conserve monarchs include conserving their habitat and, and reducing the stressors that they face. One thing we don't recommend is uh, rearing monarchs for conservation. It's been a really popular activity for a long time for educational purposes, and that's absolutely fantastic. Um, we recommend raising small numbers of them if you're going to do it for education and to make sure that you use the best practices by keeping containers clean, keeping monarchs separate, um, making sure that they have enough fresh milkweed and water, and then releasing them at appropriate times of year in the right areas. Uh, but we do think that focusing on rearing monarchs at high volumes introduces a lot of unnecessary risk and we don't really have strong evidence that that's actually going to help reverse the population decline and could instead interrupt things like ongoing studies or in introduce disease or genetic issues with the population. We have a lot of monarch publications and resources, including more information about overwintering sites in California and how to better protect them, milkweed, um, what managers can do to better mow, graze, burn land to benefit monarchs in their habitat, find milkweed, and plant nectar plants. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you and leave us on this wonderful slide of a cow coexisting with milkweed in a farm in Wisconsin by one of our staff members, Thelma Heidel, a Heidel Baker.